in 1970, uh, 44 years ago when I was a young man, I had a near-death experience. I was killed in a motorcycle wreck in Eugene, Oregon, and uh, I happened to have this wreck in front of an uh, ambulance location, and they just came around and picked me up and took me to the hospital. They put me in the ICU, the intensive care unit, and about three hours later I went into a coma. Uh, I had rather extensive uh, there scars here on my wrist and stuff, leg injuries, uh, I have steel in my femur here, I have uh, I lost the kneecap on, on my uh, right leg, I had uh, part of my wrist was up here by my elbow, pushed up under the skin, I was pretty well destroyed. So three hours later I went into a coma and I went out of body. When I was about five years old, uh, I was recommended to go in for a tonsillectomy because my, you know, my tonsils were supposedly infected and it turned out that they actually weren't, so the doctor didn't take them out, but I did go through the operation. What happened was um, they took me into the operating room and uh, in those days they had a big mask that they put over you for the anesthetic. It was a little different than nowadays. And um, when they put the mask over my face, he said, you know, he just said, breathe deeply. So I breathed and it, it was okay, pretty much, except that, I, of course, I went out right away, which I would, being five, you know. <laughs> the next thing I knew, I just shot up out of my body. And for a while, I, I looked down and saw myself, you know, being operated on and stuff. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. You know, I was just looking at, at myself and them. and. <laughs> I became aware of my clairvoyance at the age of 14 through a near-death experience. Off and on for six years, I just came to a point where I began to hear, feel, and see. I had a second near-death experience at 41 um, in a head-on collision. And in that experience, all I can remember is rising above my body into a vibrant green light. And um, when the two cars hit, I never felt anything. I wasn't present. It was as if I was hovering above my body. I could see myself very clearly. Um, I could see myself three-dimensionally. My consciousness was the floating above my body. The thinking part of me was up here. This down here just felt like a shell but it was my shell. I totaled my automobile and my spirit and soul immediately left my body in the car and went through the tunnel we hear people talk about quickly all the way through to the other end and out the other end into pure white light. I also was spoken to with a voice what some people call a conversation with God. I was told immediately when I entered the pure light by a male voice, and we all hear whatever voice we need to hear in whatever language in which we need to hear it, telling me, Lewis, you were called here to have this conversation and to be sent back because you are not doing your work. The being of light is definitely a, a being, but not with a, a face, a figure, anything else. It's more of an energy center. It's a white light that's described as having gold around the edges, if you wish. It's the brightest, prettiest, most loving light I've ever seen. I've never been so in love or at home or with my family or with, it's, it's where I'm from. And I felt um, that this being and I had known each other for, I use the term thousands of years or eons. We had, we'd always known each other. There was no beginning, no end to how long we've known each other. If you think of each of our consciousnesses as one little grain of sand and infinite intelligence as the whole beach of sand, I was plugged back in, my little grain of sand was back on the beach, where I belonged, where I came from. And then um, I saw somebody come up to me in a black dress and 
it was my great grandmother whom I'd actually known until I was about, well, she died when I was, I think, two and a half or something like that. I called her Gaga. Everybody called her that. And I said, oh, Gaga, I haven't seen you in such a long time. And I put out my hand. She took my hand. And um, she said, well, you're just here for a little visit. I remember being in like a, a corridor of like a building that we had gone into and there was a long corridor with doors off of it like a school it had cla you know like classrooms different rooms well they opened the door to the classroom and they said you can look at this you know this is a classroom people are learning things and they were at a keyboard they were actually and you have to realize this is like 1951 because I was born in 1945. There were no such things as computers, especially personal computers. They were big, huge, room-sized things then, those days. And nobody, uh, nobody had ever heard of such a thing, you know. There were like, there were typewriters, of course, but these were not keyboards like that. They had little squares, and they also lit up. I could see the light underneath them, like some were blue, and some were red, and some were green. And I remember that the man told me, he said, you will see these later in your life. But, you know, I did have an encounter in that encounter with a fellow who came to me and introduced himself as Ben. He said that he had come to be with me in this moment so that I would not have to have the experience alone and um, told me that the only thing that I needed to know moving forward from this experience is that I did not have anything to worry about because I was hurt. I was... I was hurt and I was trapped in the car for 45 minutes. But he had the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen and was very gentle. Um, he called me by name from the first meeting. He spoke very softly and very gently. As soon as he touched me, I completely went limp. But then as he stepped back from the car, he said, I have to go now and smiled and vanished in thin air. And I knew I had literally been touched by an angel. I was in this state of consciousness which was with my soul and my spirit at this source. I was no longer in my body at all. I said, well, I surrender, take me, I'm yours, I will do your work. And I was told immediately, no, it's not my work you need to do, Lewis, it's your work. I then asked, well, what is my work? Since I was in a place where all knowledge is known and I could feel that, I assumed I was going to be told what my work is. And instead of being told, I was asked, well, what is it that keeps you from being all you're capable of being? Well, I didn't know because I thought everything was fine. So I felt something about difference that prevented my soul from connecting with the soul of another. I did not know how to bridge the gap. And when I said this in the light, in my conversation with God, then just like the best moment in the movie Amadeus when Mozart hit a perfect note and went, there it is. The voice of God said to me, there it is, Lewis, there is your work. And that was my conversation. I was then sent back down the entire same tunnel in white light until I remember coming into the body until like those tight rubber gloves I'm not fully in until I am and then whew, this white light disappeared and I was sitting in my automobile a totaled automobile badly damaged with no physical damage and I walked out of the car into the ambulance to tell them there's no problem. I was a young man in my early 20s, and I decided to come back here. I wasn't done with the reason I had been here. I clearly remember squeezing down, getting smaller, and coming into my body. It was like slamming back into the pain of this existence. So I come back, at that time, a college student studying mechanical engineering and physics. I come back into this life, and I go on with that career, but they're teaching me Newtonian physics. They're teaching me that this is 3D is it. And I'm always from the beginning, from then on, I'm on the other side. No, no, there's, there's all the rest of this energy. There's all the rest of this out here. 
I don't remember going in specifically to my body, except that you know it was such, it was like going down a, a very small, like a funnel or something. You know, it was like I just swooshed back in, and I heard the doctor say, "I thought we were going to lose her there for a minute." I tried to lift my arm, and it felt so heavy after having been really light, and it was so nice being not in a body because everything was light and I could just go where I wanted to, you know, without even thinking. And I tried to lift my arm and it weighed a ton. And I thought to myself, oh no, not this again. <laughs> and then without any warning whatsoever, it's just like someone thrust me back into my body again. I came to consciousness about 90 seconds later, uh, back in my physical body. I was actually impaled on the dash with my knee um, for 45 minutes. About 20 minutes after the accident and after this fellow disappeared, then I started feeling pain in my right foot, my knee, my arm was broken, my ribs were broken. I can remember the young woman who was bound and determined to get me out of the car and was yanking on the door and screaming for people to help for her to get me out of the car. But had she got me out of the car, I probably wouldn't walk today. First off, when I had the near-death experience in 1970, I started talking about it. And this, I was on the head injury floor, and so the chief psychiatrist wanted to put me in the nut house because this isn't true. What, do you think you're Jesus? You, you died and you came back? What is that? You know, you're crazy. So he wants to throw me in the nut house. And the nurses, they, they know, they've heard, they've, they've seen it too many times. And they're hugging me and say, shh, don't. Yeah, but it's true. I've got to tell him. So he's saying to me, so you think you're Jesus? And I say, look, I went there, I did it. You've got a, a degree, you're a doctor and all that, but you've never been there. And you're telling me it doesn't exist because you have a degree? I believe they may have given my body painkillers, but I was out of the body. So people say, well, it's a drug effect in your mind. No, I'm out of the body. I remember coming back into the room and coming back into the body and seeing myself and coming into it. I finally get out of the hospital. I go to the pastor at my church. And he says, well, it can't possibly be true because it doesn't agree with scripture. And I said, wait a minute. It doesn't agree with your interpretation of the scripture. It's true, I went there. Those people who want to say, well, it was a drug, or well, it was something else, they're looking for it to be something else because they don't want to hear what we're saying. I would say not to let other people discourage you. Some people let other people say, oh, well, you couldn't have seen that, or you couldn't have, you know, da-da-da. And, of course, I would say believe in what you have seen and what you've experienced. You know, if you did experience this, it's a good thing. There was no confusion. This was not a dream. This was my real experience of my soul outside of my body outside of my personality, outside of my e ego, and outside of my human form, having a real experience at what I call the source of all energy and all spirit from which we all come. Just when I say I've been in the light and experienced all knowledge, where there's nothing but love and light and truth and peace and grace, they are still not enough when you add all the words together to fully describe what I experienced. It was more real than this reality. We all remember that experience better than anything else in our life. It is embedded in us. It is burned into our mind because it was more real. So for people, how to believe it, they always want me to give them that one, how to believe it. Walk a mile in my shoes, go have your own near-death experience. Here, let me get a gun, we'll shoot you, see if you die. You know, I mean, we can't do that. So they want, the, they want to know, like I do, I was lucky to be killed. Think about what I'm saying. I was lucky to be killed and then to come back so that I could say all of this and know all of this.